Okay, so tech money and politics. I want to start by just sort of taking a read of the room here. Um, who here makes tech for money? Which is something I do. Not everyone does, but a lot of us do that. Makes sense, given the context. Um, who here makes tech at a tech company? It's not something everybody does. A smaller proportion. Mm, depends on your definition whether I do or not. Um, I have in the past. Who here uses products that are programmed at a tech company? I'd imagine most of you do, right? Um, if you've been on the internet today. Who here pays for products that were programmed at a tech company? Pays money for products? Say, maybe you have a GitHub subscription. Maybe you have a domain name registered. Or a cell phone. Ooh, a cell phone, yeah. Exactly. Who um, makes product or advice that they sell to other tech companies? Yeah, so few people do. So I want to kind of say the words money and sell a lot here today to sort of get us into the topic because we talk a lot about passion, we talk, talk a lot about sort of euphemistic ways for this, but we're part of this economy, right? That is a tech industry in this broader economy. And I want to talk about a little bit how that works. Um, generally, the way that tech companies make money, some of them make money by selling things for a profit. Very, very few companies these days make money by selling products or services for a profit. The way that most tech companies make money these days is that they basically create products until they um, reach an exit event, which is, I don't know why they're called events, as though this is like sort of geological, but um, <laughs> generally that's, not generally, the two, the two exit events that we talk about are a sale or an acquisition by a bigger company or an IPO, which is when they, they go public on a stock exchange. And when one of those two things happens, there's a large amount of money given to the company, but it's not, that's a really broad term, right? And what actually happens there, who actually makes money, are the shareholders. And so who are the shareholders in a tech company? It of course depends on the tech company. Some of them may be employees, the people whose labor made the product or service that's being acquired or being offered in the stock market. However, um, usually that's a really small percentage of the people who are shareholders in a company when one of these events happens. Generally what happens is you have investors who have given some amount of money in exchange for, to own a fraction of the company. So they've given money to the people who actually make the products in exchange to own a fraction of the company. And then when one of these events happens, they recoup that investment. We um, call folks who do this in the tech world, for whatever reason, we call them venture capitalists. And I think it's kind of ridiculous. It kind of sounds like a like Victorian cowboy novel, but it has <laughs> something to do with like the risk involved, supposedly, right? Because it's usually made really early on. And so the grand majority of folks who make money when an event happens with a tech company are going to be VCs. They're going to be investors that happened at some point along the way. Um, this is relevant to the open source world as well. I, I want to be clear about that. This isn't something just because, you know, even if you're the, you have the grayest of beard and the Linuxiest of laptops, this is still something that's relevant to your world. Um, open source companies operate by this model as well. Um, a, a lot of them do. So like Red Hat or MySQL or all of these other sort of open source, big open source companies also are invested in by VCs and are aiming for this sort of event that happens. So I want to lay that out because I'm going to say the words VC a lot during this talk. So I wanted to explain exactly who that was because it wasn't really clear to me um, for a long time either. So VCs are making a lot of money. And, and sometimes early employees as well are making a lot of money on some of these events, which can be in the billions of dollars, right? And they're spending that money on many things. Some of them are dumb, America's Cup. But some of them um, are really relevant to our everyday lives. And some of them are political races and candidates. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. That money, which we, as the, a lot of people in this room, who everyone who raised their hand at any point during that talk, that's our money and our labor, indirectly or directly, going towards this stuff. So. Um, a lot of that money is being spent on a national level. Um, sometimes when I tell people the title of this talk, they're like, oh, Obama. And that's true. Um, a lot of tech money did go to Obama in both his campaigns. Um, other national candidates as well have been the recipient of money from the tech industry. Um, a big a sort of unusually large one recently um, was Ro Khanna, who is a candidate for um, House of Representatives in San Jose, so sort of in the, in the in Silicon Valley's sort of home turf, um, and over $4 million was spent trying to elect him as sort of like this notably tech-friendly candidate 
um, from that district, which it didn't work, but he will be running again this year, so you'll probably hear about it. Uh, also, a lot of that is spent on lobbyists on a federal level, like other industries. Um, and actually, actually, the growth in lobbying from the tech industry is going up sort of, we, we often say hockey stick in this industry a lot for whatever reason, but that growth is really going up exponentially. Um, so both lobbyists and you know, campaign, campaign donations are, those are bought and paid for with the expectation that you'll get a quid pro quo, that you'll get something in return. On a national level, what, there's sort of a, a, a broad consensus about what those things are that tech money wants in return for its political investments um, and donations. Um, there are four main ones, um, immigration, tax policy, cybersecurity, and net neutrality. I'm not going to talk about any of those. Um, I'm not going to talk about immigration because there are some third rails in our industry that we don't talk about in public. Um, I, I would yeah. love to see somebody who, who knows more than me and who could talk about it. I would love to, to hear that talk. It's not going to be delivered by me. Um, tax policy. What the tech industry wants is basically the same as what every industry wants. They don't want to pay them. Um, <laughs> Cybersecurity, cyber, cyber security and net neutrality are vitally important. Other people talk about them. Other people talk about them better than I, so I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on state and local level initiatives from the tech industry. Um, and the reason why I'm going to do that is because that's actually just sort of a personal belief that I hold, that those political initiatives are far more impactful on our everyday lives than national politics in general. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of movement going on there that I don't didn't hear a lot about until I started looking for it, basically. So I want to tell you about it. I want to give a caveat, which you probably won't be surprised by. This is going to be focused mainly on California and the Bay Area. A couple of reasons why. One is that that's where I'm from. San Francisco is my hometown, so I know a lot about it. It's very important to me. Two is that um, I think that a lot of these techniques and strategies are being refined there because it is so close to the sort of root of Silicon Valley. A lot of the money that is being generated up here flows back down there. I mean, if, if any of you work for Intel or Intel subsidiaries, that's going to Santa Clara. Um, a third is that we're all moving up here as we get priced out anyway, so <laughs> consider me like a, like a, a time traveler from the future, future dyst like waterless dystopia down there. Um, so that is the question, right? What does tech money care about on a state and local level? <sighs> so I don't know if this idiocy made it all the way up north here, but this was a big news story um, in California last year. And as you can see, it's on Colbert. It made national news. Um, this is six Californias. It is a plan to split California into six states, including that red one would be Central California, and it would be the poorest state in the union. Um, bordering it there, and this is a spoiler alert for the next slide, that yellow guy that includes San Jose, San Francisco, and Marin County would be called Silicon Valley and be one of the wealthiest. Um, sort of small government and all that. This is completely unworkable. It is a terrible plan. Um, that said, it is uh, because California has some, <laughs> some quirks in its constitution. It's like a manic pixie dream state constitution. <laughs> um, you can put whatever you want on the ballot um, if you have the signatures, which translates to money, basically. Um, this is a ballot initiative that was being planned um, in 2014. They collected um, about a million signatures. There were about 750,000 of those were valid, which is actually a pretty good statistic for California, if that gives you anything about how broken this process is. Um, they missed getting it actually on the ballot by about 50,000 signatures, but they're gearing up again to do it again in um, 2016. When I say they, I actually mean one man. Um, this, is, this is Tim Draper. He is a billionaire venture capitalist. He is the son of a billionaire venture capitalist. He is the grandson of another billionaire <laughs> venture capitalist. And his son is also a VC. Um, he is the sole funder of Six Californias. He's also the founder of Draper, Fisher, Jervitz, and Associates. Some of his investments through that firm have included, early investments have included Skype, Hotmail, 
Tesla, Baidu, which is like the Japanese search engine, or sorry, Chinese search engine, um, Twitch, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, uh, and also an unaccredited university named after him in San Mateo offering degrees in entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, so he's the sole founder of Six Californias. He poured $5 million into um, funding that initiative, which if you're doing a math in your head, yeah, it costs about six, five to six dollars a signature to get something on the ballot in California. So this is sort of like wacky, eccentric, rich guy thing. This is his, um, this is actually this, this is Draper University. This is the seating in Draper University. It's beanbag only. Um, no, I'm not, I'm like 100% serious. That's Sam, the streets of San Mateo. That's the university. Um, I used to walk by it every day on the way to work. So it's sort of like this like wacky, he's so eccentric. Um, except one thing is that this is not his first political venture, actually. Um, in 2000, which yes, there was a time, you know, the time that dare not speak its name when there was last a lot of tech money floating around for folks to do beanbaggy things with. Um, <laughs> in 2000, Proposition 38 proposed to give every student in the state $4,000 to attend private school with no regulation, no constraints, no means testing whatsoever. It was a plan to privatize public education in the state of California. It would have cost $3.3 billion um, to the state. Uh, Tim spent $23 million on that proposition. Um, his dad threw in another $2.5 million. It was, believed th ah, it was believed at that point, sorry, I'm trying to scroll on my there we go. It was believed at that point to be the largest contribution by an individual to a ballot um, proposition in California history at the time. It's a lot of money. Um, it was far, to, it's still pretty firmly in beanbag territory. Like this was far to the right. The, there's a, there was a movement that has since lost steam called voucher or school choice, which was advocating this. But this idea of giving everybody this huge amount of money in the state was like far to the right of any any remotely practical person's um, proposition, like proposal at that time. And it failed handily, although opponents spent another like 30 million to, to sort of campaign against it at that point. Um, again, like I said, this is still sort of beanbag territory, except that at that point, um, in, in 1998, he was appointed to the State Board of Education. So, with his only qualification being the development of a business simulation kid game for kids, Governor Pete Wilson um, appointed Tim Draper to the State Board of Education. He also happened to be quite a major fundraiser for Pete Wilson. Funny how that works. Um, but this is actually quite a powerful position. The Board of Education has a lot of power in any state, particularly in California. They select textbooks, they set education policy, and they measure and evaluate policies that are already set. So that's kind of troubling, I would say, from so, for someone who then would go on the next year to propose completely privatizing the state public education system. Um, he was not reappointed when Governor Wilson was replaced by Gray Davis. However, he was replaced on the State Board of Education by this man. This is Reed Hastings. You likely know Reed Hastings as the CEO of Netflix. Um, He's also on the board of Facebook, and he was at one point on the board of Microsoft. He was already rich when he founded Netflix from a $750 million buyout. Um, he's a major, major, major Democratic donor, and his name will come up if you read anything about tech donations to Obama. Uh, and he was a special supporter also of the newly elected Governor Davis. And he, he actually stayed on the Board of Education for quite a while. He was there for four or five years, um, through the beginning of Governor Schwarzenegger's term. Yeah, California. Um, <laughs> Not our worst governor in recent memory, uh, oddly. <laughs> um, and he served as the president of the Board of Education for four years. So this is, a, this is a pretty weighty position. And like Tim Draper, he had his own big, school, big money school bill on the ballot in 2000. There was another proposition in 2000 on the ballot, and it was called Proposition 39. And what Proposition 39's main goal was to reduce the threshold to pass a local bond measure for the schools from 66% of the votes to 55% of the votes. So you would only need to get 55% of people to say yes to get a school bond issued, which means money to build schools. And this passed easily, um, probably at least partially because Prop 39's proponents, including Reed Hastings, outspent their opponents six to one. They raised over $31.5 million altogether. Reed himself gave a million of his own money. 
Most of the rest of it was raised thanks in part to Reed's buddy and the campaign co-chair, John Doerr. He gave six million of his own money to Prop 39. John Doerr is a billionaire partner at Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers. You probably have read about them most recently in conjunction with the Ellen Powell gender discrimination case. Um, but they are very, very, very powerful and wealthy firm in Silicon Valley, and they've made their substantial wealth by investing in basically everything. Um, Google, Amazon, AOL, Intuit, Sun, EA, Genentech, Zynga, our local heroes, Puppet, and these were all very early investments. They made a lot of money off of them. Kleiner Perkins, the firm, kicked in a, another million dollars uh, to Proposition 39, and the other partners sort of shook out their couch cushions and popped came up with another 1.5 million. Uh, more than 8 million total made from investments in some of the companies I just said went to pass Proposition 39. So I see some perplexed faces in the audience, which is like, where am I going with this? Which is a fair question, right? All of this just to like lower the voting threshold? Like that's a worthy cause and it did in fact help to get school bonds passed, but that's kind of random, right? Like what is Kleiner Perkins doing? So as it turns out, there is a proposition or uh, a provision of Proposition 39 that has nothing to do with bond funding. So, charter schools. Mm. Charter schools. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. I didn't pay. I'm not paying for the sounds. Um, <laughs> charter schools are private organizations. They can be nonprofit or for profit that run public schools and they're funded by the government per pupil the way that public schools are. It's been um, and out of taxpayer dollars per student, right? And charter schools are part of this sort of growing movement over the past 20 years. It's often called, called education reform. The idea being to sort of hand over the operation of the public school system to these private organizations. Prop 39 had a provision in it that required that public, distri public districts provide charter schools with space reasonably equivalent to those used by non-charter students in the district. So basically, if a charter school wants space, they must be be provided space, and it must be identically furnished and located in the area that the charter school wants it to be located in. Yeah, um, I'm sure you can think of some ways that could go wrong, and you don't have to think very far. What you can do is you can go look, and in LA, they've um, fulfilled that request via the controversial practice of co-location which is very, very little reading of that provision. And it says, you want it, you get six classrooms in the same building as the other, as the non-charter school. This doesn't go very well often, and the charter schools are not happy about it. And in fact, this conflict um, culminated recently with a drawn out series of lawsuits, which I believe are still in process against the LA Unified School District by the California Charter Schools Association. Let me pause again to say, where is she going with this? Well. Guess who's on the board of the California Charter Schools Association? <laughs> Reed Hastings is on the board of the California Charter Schools Association. Reed Hastings is also on the board of Aspire Public Schools. Um, their board also includes Steve Merrill, who is a former partner at Benchmark Capital, which is a VC firm famous for their huge return on investment off of eBay, also major investors in New Relic. See, I'm putting some local flavor in here. Um, he's also on the, uh, Reed Hastings is also on the board of KIPP, KIPP is a massive nationwide charter network. He educates a huge amount of children. Um, he's joined on the board there by the CEO of Viacom and the former director of Bain Capital. Bain Capital, besides you know, being really good at unfortunate photo ops, is also has a pretty substantial tech investment arm. They've invested in companies like Optimizely, Rent the Runway, and LinkedIn. He, Reid Hastings is also on the board and a major investor in rocket, the Rocketship K-5 network. And that's a charter network that's known for its aggressive growth. They actually have their own real estate firm dedicated to um, obtaining properties for them to build schools on. Their former CEO, now Rocketship is a tech haven. Their former CEO, John Danner, was made rich in the first tech boom. He's a tech CEO. Um, they count among their major investors, and we're talking major, um, the CFO of Skype, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook, um, legendary venture capitalist Arthur Rock, who's famous for investing, and in, when I say early, I mean early on, Fairchild Semi, Apple, and Intel, uh, Menlo Ventures, who funded Uber and Warby Parker, Excel Partners, who um, uh, were the investment behind Etsy and Dropbox, and then the, um, Benchmark Capital, which I already mentioned, who also own parts of Snapchat, Instagram, and Yelp. Also the aforementioned Kleiner Perkins and John Doerr. And these are all major investors. We're talking more than a million dollars a piece, often much more. That's a lot of tech money, right? 
Um, and it turns out this is actually everywhere you look once you start sort of peeking under rocks in school reform, there's tech money everywhere. Um, Lorene Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow, has been lauded for her philanthropy since his death, her sort of newfound philanthropy. A lot of that has gone to charter schools via her Emerson Collective Education Fund. Mark Zuckerberg's um, $100 million donation to Newark schools focus, which has been, by the way, like sort of a clusterfuck if you read about it, focused very heavily on charter schools. It was part of the provisions of the funding. Um, closer, a little closer to home, Jeff Bezos and his family and Paul Allen both heavily funded their recent uh, bill to allow charters in Washington state. And it's true in Oregon as well. Stand for Children, which is a major childhood advocacy group based here, has in the past sort of five-ish years sort of really taken a pivot from its original leadership, brought on a lot of folks from the school reform movement, and now has sort of the, um, got all sorts of tech money floating around there, including Ryan Finley, the founder of SurveyMonkey, who lives here, and there's multiple tech VCs on the board. And they're a huge player in Oregon state politics around education, um, and they were big against lobbying against the standardized test opt-out. What else do these organizations do with all this money? They've mainly, the Washington bill I mentioned being you know, a bit of a throwback, but they've mainly turned their focus now from state governments to local governments. They have been in the past, I would say, three to four years, an absolutely unprecedented amount of money from political action campaigns funded by these organizations and folks poured into school board elections across the country. So in Oakland, where I originally gave this talk, um, there was $185,000 from tech PACs in the, um, in the school board election in 2012, 150,000 in 2014. West Contra Costa County, which is a county you've likely never heard of in the east of the Bay Area, they had $350,000 last year on, from one PAC in one school board race. Um, in Minneapolis last year, we saw $285,000 from Arthur Rock and his friends. That's pretty far from home. We're seeing this in New Jersey, we're seeing this in New Orleans, we're seeing this all over the country. And I wanna be clear when I say unprecedented, this is an order of magnitude more money than, normal, than has in the past been spent on school board races. These are local affairs you're talking about, even in big cities, a pretty small number of voters to sway and a very sort of narrow set of interests. So this kind of money is, is new and it's big. So why, what, what is the goal with this spend? So this, these are a couple quotes that I think are instructive about this. The first one says, the fundamental problem with school districts is that they don't get to control their boards. The importance of the charter school movement is to evolve America from a system where governance is constantly changing. So we, you know, Reed Hastings, when asked, what's wrong with school districts, he says, definitely they're democratically elected school boards. That's the problem with school districts. Um, this is a stated goal of the charter school movement is to shrink school board power. And this is often where the opposition, when it happens to charters, happens at a school board level, right? So that doesn't really answer the question why, though, right? Why all this money into charters? So I think the second quote is really instructive for that. And he says, the school district still exists in New Orleans. New Orleans, by the way, their public school system is entirely charter as of a couple years ago. Bringing to town more and more charter school networks, sort of like a chamber of commerce would to develop business. I hope that it will become a long-term model for great education. So as always, we want to kind of follow the money here, right? Why charter schools, why tech? Well, let's look at rocket ship, right? Rocket ship is a huge proponent of this concept of blended learning. And that's classroom time backed up by computer-based instruction. And there's a ton of online work involved in charter schools. These are, these are often just hotbeds of educational sort of technology. Um, some schools and some of the biggest charter school networks are actually entirely online. They don't have physical capacities. You're having literally kindergartners up through college taking classes entirely online. This is an, a newish sector of our industry. It's called EdTech. It's been growing hugely. EdTech is broad. EdTech covers a lot of things, including massive online courses and instructional technology for adults. But specifically, K through 12 EdTech has been growing in, like hugely in the last four years. It's been a, a, an exponential growth pattern, right? And this includes things like fully online classes, it's apps to drill to test, it's classroom management, it's broad. Any way you could think of to get a computer in the classroom or even to get hardware in the classroom, EdTech is trying it, basically. Um, EdTech is being grown as an industry through the investments and encouragement of a lot of the folks I've just named, if not all of them. 
One example would be Dreambox, which is an online math education system. It was bought for eight figures by Reed Hastings and John Doerr. It's now used in all rocket ship schools. John Danner, I mentioned, was the former CEO of rocket ship. He left to develop an app that's being used in rocket ship schools. Scott Hamilton, the founder of Kip, left Kip to found an ed tech company. There are VC firms that only invest in ed tech these days. There are multiple ed tech accelerators. There are multiple ed tech publications that focus just on this sector of industry. It's a huge and growing sector. And the size of the K-12 market specifically of ed tech is projected to be over 800 billion by the end of this year. There's so much money in it. Now, that's not to say there aren't challenges in investing in ed tech, right? And so this is a quote from our favorite, you know, pointy-headed thought leader, Mark Andreessen. And he says, I wouldn't want to back a business that's selling to public schools or characterized by public financing, unions, or government-run institutions. Those institutions are incredibly hostile to change. And that's a really interesting quote because Mark Andreessen, who is not just a Twitter thought stormer, he is also a prominent venture capitalist. He's made famous, basically, for investing in Netscape very early on. Mark Andreessen does invest in ed tech. And you'll notice in this quote, he doesn't say he doesn't invest in ed tech. And so a close reading of it sort of gets at some of the strategies for getting ed tech to grow as a sector. Um, one of which being that he, they've recently hired Adrian Fenty, who's an ex-mayor of DC and a huge charter school advocate, explicitly to do political lobbying for their portfolio companies, right? So one way of doing this is sort of changing the way public schools, as, they can, as you conceive of them, exist, so you can change how they procure things. And that's been a very lucrative path for sort of the rocket ship model. Another one that's growing recently is to bypass schools entirely and to go to parents and students because there's less regulation. Now, what's interesting about that is those are almost always modeled for free because it's hard to integrate a product into an entire classroom if only some people can pay for it. Now, a thing that we know about free products is that if you're not paying for a product, you're not buying it, you're the product being sold. Um, the product there in the business model involves the student data that's being extracted. Um, having political sway to change or influence the regulations around what you can do with student data could be really valuable if you're developing companies like that. And there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of more and more of behavior management and sort of surveillance type ed tech apps that are being developed. Okay, so I want to stop right here and like cut off a conversation that I'm not interested in having. I totally believe that your kid might be doing awesome at a charter school. I totally believe that Teacher America saved your life. I am, I do not think technology in the classroom is inherently bad. I don't want to go smash all the iPads. Um, I don't think ed tech in and of itself is morally charged. I think the charter school argument is really complex. There are two million American students in charter schools. I do not think they're all deluded. I do not think all the admins and teachers who work very hard at those charter schools to give those kids an education are evil or are scheming for profit. I don't think any of those things at all. That said, I think what's happening here is we're seeing a private infrastructure being built under our noses by people who are openly advocating for less democratic processes in order to advance their own economic interests. And that bothers me, right? I think it's reasonable to be bothered by that. Um, Public schooling has been sort of cast as the cornerstone of our democracy since our democracy began. It's a really important part of our society and our life. Whether you agree or disagree with ed tech or with the education reformers' approach to public schooling, our ability to have that conversation at all is being usurped by how these processes are happening. And I think that's really a problem, and it's disturbing just as, an, as a person who exists in this society. As a tech worker, it's being usurped with my own labor and with your own labor, and that with money that we are generating for our bosses. And that's like, that's a big deal to me, and I hope it's a big deal to you. Another reason why I think this is important to pay attention to is there's something that we know about tech companies, right? And that's that they copy the shit out of each other, right? <laughs> like, you go from MySpace to Facebook, and then, you know, sometimes they improve on each other. If you look at MySpace, Facebook, you know, Lyft, Sidecar, Uber, stuff like that, right? So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a model that I see as sort of um, taking this political interference model and building on it that I find even, I've not even more learned, but I find equally alarming and that I hope I can empower all of you to go out into the world and watch out for. Does anyone know who this is? We're a little far afield from his, his evil lair. <laughs> Anybody know? It's Ron Conway. 
Yes, it's Ron Conway. So Ron Conway is an enormously prolific angel investor. Ron Conway has made early investments in Airbnb, in Google, in PayPal, in Twitter, Zynga, Facebook, BuzzFeed, Reddit, Pinterest, Mint, Square, and over 650 other tech companies. You have likely interacted with a Ron Conway investment today. I would be surprised if you haven't. And he is richer than God. He has so much money. This is maybe his most impressive investment to date, which is the city and entire political apparatus of San Francisco. <laughs> and lest, lest you think that this is where I'm starting to slide into tinfoil hat category, this is all public record. This is very much an open thing that's going on in my hometown. Basically, in 2011, he negotiated a, tw a tax break for his portfolio companies, Twitter and Zynga. He liked that so much that he decided, I like this, I'm gonna stick around. He spent $600,000 getting our mayor, Ed Lee, elected, likely reelected. He then went on to buy six or seven, depending on how you're counting, supervisors, um, Board of Supervisors being our city council, in order to enact laws favorable to companies he invests in. Unless you think, again, that I'm exaggerating, he did this so blatantly with the recent short-term rental law that competitors to his investment, Airbnb, are suing him in the city for cutting them out of the deal. That's what he's been doing in SF lately. This is Greg Sir. Greg Sir is the chief of police in my hometown of San Francisco. Um, I bring him up here because he is often described as an old friend of Ron Conway. And as old friends, they set up a partnership a few years ago that I think is pretty foreshadowing. Um, Ron Conway has a political consortium of tech companies called SF.City. In 2011, they made a widely publicized $100,000 donation to the SFPD, and that was actually that donation was paid out to a member company of the consortium to develop an app for the police department. So that public-private partnership was engineered basically entirely through Conway's sort of draw in City Hall. Ron Conway in, and I think this is instructive because after this, Ron Conway, in response to Sandy Hook, came out saying, gun safety is where I'm focusing my philanthropic efforts. Philanthropic efforts is a weird word to say, frankly, to use, because what he's actually doing is he's funding, he's funding an entrepreneurship challenge. And what he's actually said, his words, I'm looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page for gun safety. So what he's doing is he's investing in technological solutions for gun violence. Partially that's been in the private owner market, which as we know in America is huge, but there also have been a series of co these competitions focused on community safety, which is the euphemistic term for police. When you hear community, they're talking about police. His partner in announcing this challenge, Ian Sobieski, said of it, there is money to be made, gun violence is expensive to society, and there is a big potential market for solutions. And Ian Sobieski would know. Why would he know? Well, he's a VC with the ridiculously named Band of Angels, that's what they're called, I swear. Um, that's not like a ridiculous t-shirt company or anything. Um, and one of his proud investments is with SST Inc. And if you've ever read sort of anything about like military contracting, you know like the three letter acronym means something super scary is going on, right? SST Inc. was formerly known as Shot Spotter. And what they make is, a, is an audio gunshot detection uh, system. And in several cities around the country, including Oakland, they install dozens of hidden microphones, and the idea being that the system activates when it detects a gunshot and it notifies the police. So, as it turns out, they're actually just on all the time, um, and they record a lot, and they record voice conversations. That may have, at least in Oakland, been a feature, not a bug. Um, Oakland is in the process of building or attempting to build the 11 million do domain awareness center, which is a centralized data hub for sort of collecting various data streams for law enforcement, bringing in all this data, running it through, say, gunshot detection software, um, sort of face uh, recognition software, data mining software, smart alerting software, what I'm getting at here is that there's a lot of software to be made for applications like this. And so far, they've um, been getting bids mainly from military contractors, but Google actually put in a bid we found out through Freedom of Information Acts a couple years ago. Google has products that already do this that they've marketed to other municipalities. Google isn't the only people. And New York 
Microsoft helped develop a do what they call a domain awareness system, and they now market to smaller municipalities. That one's called Automated Workplace for the Analysis of Real-Time Events, Microsoft Aware. In case, in case anyone was not clear that we are living in a George Orwell novel. Um, <laughs> this is a market that exists, right? This market for surveillance tech and this market specifically for policing tech. It exists and it's growing. And in some ways, when I sort of talked and I've made shout outs to various tech company forebears in this, in this conversation, I think the sort of billion dollar unicorn in the room has to be Palantir. Because what we have there is we have Palantir is this huge company. It's worth literally billions of dollars that was founded by former, what they call themselves, the PayPal mafia, um, former PayPal employees, many of whom were at the time and now still are VCs, Peter Thiel, um, other folks like that. It's euphemistically a big data company, but what it, what it, was, it was funded from the beginning by the CIA. It's a contractor to various military agencies to um, process their intelligence data. And when you've... You've, so that was one application of it, and we're starting to see now more and more the market for smaller and more local scale applications of it. Um, one of the big ones that's come out in recent years is this concept of, or in the past year-ish, predictive policing. I am laying them on thick and fast with the, the creepy euphemisms here, but predictive policing claims to take big data, big data, again, being, being surveillance data on citizens and analyze it to predict where crime is more likely to happen. And if you think that's a good idea, you, your ass better be in the seat tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to see Karina's talk about algorithms. Um, there's a lot of, of really, really troubling things about that. I mean, not the least of which is that there's very little data to show that it works. But um, beyond, even beyond that, and pre there's one, uh, one of the main companies that's been selling this whole narrative of predictive policing is called Predpol. Mm -hmm. uh, there's imitators now, Hunch Lab, Street Cred. You can go on AngelList, and there's over 150 law enforcement startups now. And they're marketing directly to law enforcement. So. <laughs> What other sort of technological, and so here's where it starts to get dicey, right? There's reasons to think that technological solutions might help for some aspects of law enforcement. One major one would be body cameras, right? And this is not even really a debate anymore that, that police should wear body cameras. However, I think it's good to look at who's making body cameras and who's making money off of them. The major manufacturer of body cameras in this country is Taser. There's a couple pretenders to it, but Taser, who makes the non-lethal, big old air quotes, um, stun guns, also makes body cameras. So the thing about Taser's body cameras is that that's not very lucrative. You sell a single piece of equipment to a company, to a, to a, a department, that has uncertain revenue streams. You don't know if they're going to replace them. They're not that expensive at, in the age of GoPros, right? Where Taser's actual money is, and you can look at their um, stock market returns, and this is reflected in their recent sort of earnings. Um, where they're going to make the money is their cloud-based offering. All the data recorded by a camera has to go somewhere, right? And so Taser's money is really going to come out of evidence.com. And evidence.com is a cloud server where evidence is uploaded. And we don't know that much about it otherwise, because a lot of times these contracts that are signed aren't subject to, to public overview. Lest you think again that I am putting on my tinfoil hat about why this is scary, on the board of Taser, are various former law enforcement and military folks, and also Haiti Partovi, who is the director of Code.org, famous sort of learn to code nonprofit, and formerly was of Microsoft and MySpace, and Brett Taylor, who worked on Google Maps and was the CTO of Facebook. Taser is, in a lot of ways, positioning itself as a tech company, and it's courting tech dollars. And as Taser is sort of the big company, we will start to see it, I will predict this with certainty, we will start to see it disrupted by companies who are looking for investment from people who are rich off of our labor. Um, an interesting thing is you start seeing municipalities announce that they are adopting body cameras. Pay really close attention to how far along on that contract process you are. You cannot sign a contract for body cameras in three weeks. Most of these, these deals have been worked on and they've been been being developed, right? And so in some ways, we have, again, a, mo a, real mo a real movement and a real concern for police reform, right? Which is very worthy and needs to happen. And we're being sold a technological solution to it that's lining the, the pockets of folks who have nothing to do with the original call for reform. 
I don't think body cameras are necessarily a bad idea, again, to cut off that argument. I do think there are a lot of real concerns about sort of um, chain of evidence and privacy and um, data collection and stuff like that. And frankly, to see it in the hands of the folks who are doing the same thing in our school districts gives me pause, and I think it's, it's something to worry about. Um, another th the last thing I want to say about Taser is that Look at what they've done in Albuquerque and look at how their contract went in San Francisco. They're engineering no-bid contracts that are, being, that are being signed and funded without any oversight from any elected officials. I think in a lot of ways, the legal barriers to some of the stuff that the police tech industry, which I don't think they're even, I, I will, it's, we'll see what they call themselves. It'll be something like community em empowerment or something really like that. Um, <laughs> I think that the legal barriers that they're facing are more easily surmountable than the ones that this charter school movement has steamrolled. So I want to conclude. Look, we all make trade-offs to pay the bills, right? Um, I don't want people to walk away from this feeling guilty, necessarily. Um, does this happen everywhere? Sure. Every industry lobbies, right? Every industry tries to manipulate politics for their own return. I think in tech, we're exceptionally naive about that. We seem really committed to denying any sort of downsides of the economy we live off of. I think a lot of engineers think that politics is too messy or it's beneath their intellect. Um, I think that's silly because we're supposed to be good at big systems, but I also think it's just so naive because when you're just determinately being apolitical when your bosses are using the money you generate on political change, you're not impartial. You're just being played for a sucker. And like, I want to be clear, I did a lot of research for this, but I wasn't like filing Freedom of Information Acts. Like, this is all out there, and it's written, being written by journalists, and we could do a better job paying attention. Finally, um, <laughs> shitty that I could say this now and when I originally wrote this talk in December. I considered starting this talk with a moment of silence. I'll let you fill in what I was referring to in December and what I was referring to now. Sally, they're not the same. Um, I decided then, and I am reaffirmed in it now, that we have given more than our fair share of silence in the tech industry. Um, I think we need to be louder about this stuff. I think that the voices that are being raised in terms of internal change are amazing, and I will cheer them on and boost them and hope to contribute to them to change inside our industry. But if we are bringing in, like, I tried to be very, very, fairly impartial in what I presented here, but like to be blunt, both policing and public education, the changes that are being introduced are disproportionately detrimental to people of color. And if we're gonna bring more people of color into our industry, and on the other end, be enacting policy that's sort of decimating communities. I mean, there are words for that, but they're not very polite, right? So like, I hope that we can see sort of like a holistic view of where our money is going and what our money is doing as part of our movement for diversity in tech. So thank you. Um, I